Hi. There we go. There's our camera. And can you share your screen? Sure. Let's see. So good to see. And angle sharp. Yeah. Yeah. So Florian, we've we've talked over over the years. You're um, when uh, Angle Sharp joined the .NET Foundation. Big fan. Thanks. <laughs> Sure, yeah, I'm quite happy to share now what uh, AngleSharp is about. I mean, for me, it's anyway like Christmas, uh, two best events of the year coming together, .NET Conf happening globally, and the Oktoberfest is just around the corner here in <laughs> Munich. Go. Oh my gosh, I forgot about Oktoberfest. How can I forget about that? Oh, how can you forget? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, Florian, the stage is yours. Thanks. So, without further ado, I will just jump into the topic and hopefully I make it in time. Um, the topic is AngleSharp, uh, which aims to be a .NET headless browser. Let's see where we are. Um, before I jump into it, full in the water, uh, a few words about myself. I'm Microsoft MVP for developer technologies. I'm also a contributor to open source projects, um, mostly on GitHub, of course. And I'm very enthusiastic about writing some articles of technical nature and uh, speaking at uh, events if the, if the time allows it. Uh, I'll always be, be happy to be invited and appreciate that. Um, professionally, I'm a solution architect at a small startup called Smapyot. Um, there I'm specialized in uh, distributed web applications. And the web is also the topic of this session. Um, one word of uh, uh, remark. Um, since this is an online session, I cannot see all your faces, so excuse me for being either too fast or too slow. I hope that the recording will then uh, at least uh, a little bit, um, uh, well, give you a payback on, on this one. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can always uh, reach me on, on GitHub or on Twitter if you have a specific question. Now, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. All right. Um, now, uh, what is on our play today? Um, we will first start by a quick introduction. What is AngleSharp? Um, why uh, could it be helpful for you? Uh, since AngleSharp is an HTML browser, we will also need to have a, a small excursus on HTML5. Uh, we will do that by example. I selected uh, three examples that should illustrate why HTML parsing is not uh, so simple as just putting out a, a regular expression. Then we will go into the topic of extensions. Um, uh, this is, is one of the things that makes AngleSharp special and where we will try to, to always improve our, our reach and what we can do with it. And finally, a, a small outlook uh, what the future of AngleSharp will bring. So what is AngleSharp? As I already told you, it's uh, a library for parsing HTML, but it's in fact a little bit more than that. What we try to do in order to pass HTML5 correctly, I mean, there's the core specification, but there are all kinds of specifications, actually. And if you want to really um, get a grasp on what's on the web, you should not consider just one specification, but all the side specifications also play a very important role. Like for instance, this one little thing called JavaScript, right? I mean, many websites are unfortunately these days only accessible if you also have a JavaScript engine running. Or part of the information may um, only be displayed in conjunction with special uh, CSS rules or may make only sense with these CSS rules. So there are all these different technologies that come together and form what we call the web today. And if we really want to get access to that information, um, we need also a, a browser engine that's uh, capable of doing that. Of course, your standard browser can do it, but can you do it in .NET without any, let's say, RPC calls or whatever? Um, that's the mission of AngleSharp. Now, what we uh, can do is we have a full stream processing unit like a standard web browser does, which means we do not stop when bytes arrive. We always um, uh, evaluate them. We don't wait until all the content was received. We do that on the fly. Um, we have a collection of web utilities for that, most notably um, in the encoding space. But also, for instance, we have our own URL parser. That's just because uh, the URI uh, type that's in .NET, unfortunately, is not capable of 
well, <laughs> parsing all the valid URLs that are out there. Um, this uh, URL um, parsing that we included uh, follows the specification by the heart and uh, therefore can handle all the, the cases. Um, what else we can do besides HTML, CSS? I already remarked that JavaScript plays an important role. Yes, we have uh, a solution for that. Unfortunately, at the moment, it can only deal with simple JavaScript. Um, the vision is, of course, to, to improve the, the reach here. And this is where customizations and extensions come in, because at the end of the day, we don't want to create this one giant monolithic uh, library. We want actually to foster a whole ecosystem of plugins where everyone can say, oh, this is one of the things AngleShop cannot do or does not do well at the moment, but I can just customize this and come up with my own plugin. Now, looking at the history of the project, it all started, I think, around in 2012. Um, it was actually after an MVP summit, I was on the plane and I thought, yeah, let's, let's write an HTML5 pass. I mean, uh, what else could be, could be done on a plane? Uh, honestly, it was a different angle, uh, so to speak, um, back in the day on the project, but I realized an HTML5 parser is one of the things that's missing in the .NET ecosystem. There have been other HTML parsers, right? But none of them have been following the HTML5 specification by the heart at this point in time. In 2013, I put it out on GitHub and the uh, initial reaction was quite good. I was really surprised. So there seemed to be some kind of a demand. And so I kept on going. And in 2015, we had an important milestone uh, with uh, integrated extensibility. We demonstrated that a scripting engine can be brought in, um, which was quite cool because suddenly you had uh, not only just a static document object model, um, a static representation of the page you're dealing with, but actually it could be made alive, what JavaScript brings, for instance, to the table. And then from that point on, just a lot of bug fixes, a lot of improvements, and a major refactoring of the API um, to the end user also happened. And the milestone here is the version 0.10. So right now we are at 0.13, and we want to hit the 1.0 milestone. All the major uh, breaking changes that happened since 0.10 are all quite minor, but still breaking um, in one or the other area. Now from 0.9 to 0.10, that was a huge uh, change. So there. Um, uh, we, we really made a, a drastic uh, direction change, but I think it was for the better. And uh, the ecosystem also lives now on top of the 0.10 version and of course the successors. Now one short glimpse at what how parsing uh, HTML looks like. Um, it's like um, any kind of parsing. So if we could draw pretty much the same picture for let's say uh, even programming languages like C Sharp. There, of course, we may have um, what is then called a backend with, with optimizations, etc., and code emission happening. That's not the case here, but nevertheless, the parsing stages alone, the front end is pretty much the same. So we start with a stream, a stream of just bytes, and they are interpreted in a special way by a preprocessor that also does some sanitization. Uh, in the end, the goal of this preprocessor is actually to get us characters that we can work with. Then a tokenizer comes into play. Now, the tokenizer takes a bunch of characters and says, oh, now that's a valid token. Um, for instance, an opening tag or a closing tag or an attribute or text or a comment, all these kinds of uh, different building blocks that we have. Now, until this point, we are still in the linear phase where we say, okay, we started with a linear stream of bytes. We had then a linear stream of characters, and now we have a linear stream of tokens. Now, where does the tree, the document object model come from? Well, that's done by the tree constructor. So that is, is fed on the tokens coming from the tokenizer. And now here is the semantic information that says, OK, I, I've seen that uh, opening tag. I can now close it. That's valid. Or here there is no content allowed. I will just place it on the uh, sibling element. So all these things happening in the tree constructor. And then we have a dynamic uh, object model, uh, which is called the DOM. So at the end of the day, this is all what, what's included in AngleShop. So you don't need to do anything. You just 
for instance, present the stream to AngleSharp and AngleSharp does all the rest. And at the end, you get an I document, for instance, instance. And uh, with this instance, you can actually play around. You can serialize it back. That's what we will see. You can append uh, new elements or um, get further information out of it. So let's just look at some examples by learning a little bit what makes HTML5 so, so complicated. Um, first, very simple piece of uh, HTML code. Um, what you should recognize here is I left out some of the, let's say, standard elements. Like we don't see an HTML tag here. We don't see head. We also don't see body. Well, that's not an error. That's actually a valid HTML5 document. And there are big sites, for instance, the Google error page out there, which use exactly these rules to um, <laughs> save a few bytes here and there. So um, what a valid HTML5 parser should do, it should insert these things for us. So it should automatically insert for us an HTML opening tag. It should insert for us a head opening tag. It should also close the head, and it should also, when the magenta uh, code is reached, um, create a body element for us. All these things should just happen automatically. That's by the specification. AngleSharp does that. We will see that in a second. Now, a second example where it gets a little bit tricky is there are some special kind of scoping rules in HTML. For instance, we could be in a uh, unsorted list and enter the space of a list item. <clears throat> now, if we are in a list item, we can just write another list item with the first one or the former one being implicitly closed. So that's all by the specification. A uh, simple parser may not like this um, because here the tree constructor needs to have all the additional logic. As an example, if we look at Razor um, for writing um, views in ASP.NET Core MVC, um, we will recognize that we need to close the list item. Now, that may have been a good design choice for performance reasons, but on the other hand, of course, it limits um, the output that can be generated because you can never output an HTML like this using Razor, unfortunately. Now, the same rule that applies to a list item can also apply, for instance, to a paragraph. There are multiple of these um, uh, cases. Again, this, these are not errors. These are not even warnings. This is just valid HTML, and the automatic closing just happens for you. A third example I want to give is in the table space. Well, tables are one of the most complicated um, parts of the HTML5 specification because there's so much that can, could go wrong and every edge case is essentially handled. Um, there's another space uh, which has to do with formatting elements, but since formatting elements are more or less a legacy thing, especially with the edge cases described in there, I will just focus on the table um, with this simple example. Now, what I brought in here is um, there have been some elements inserted uh, the magenta ones. So we have a break row here and we have an iframe. They're just inside the table. Note also there is no T body element, for instance, um, which is also something that needs to be uh, inserted automatically by the HTML5 parser. In addition to these, let's say, misplaced elements, we also have an invalid closing tag. So it's not even an invalid tag. I mean, uh, web components or, or Angular or any, any kind of uh, SPA framework these days uses custom tags, so that's, that's, that's no problem. Um, and then we have also uh, in green the table row, uh, which is just, uh, let's say, an orphan here. It needs to be placed in the table itself, and it isn't. So uh, what should we do with that? So let's have a look um, at all these three cases in a demonstra demonstration of AngleSharp. Um, all the, the demos you'll see today are available on GitHub. Um, the URL is uh, on the screen. All right. So <clears throat> for the first demo, I will just briefly explain what the AngleSharp part does. Uh, what we do here is we create a new so-called browsing context. Browsing context you can think of as a like a tab in your standard browser. So that's one instance where now a page can live. 
Uh, what makes a browsing context special is that you can configure it. You can tell it what it can do and what it cannot do. Like when you say in your browser to your current tab, well, you are not allowed to run JavaScript. Um, you can do that here too. So we got a new browsing context. We don't specify any configuration, which means it's the default one. And then we open a new page. Um, as the stream may be, um, well, <laughs> evaluated asynchronously, um, we need to do that in an async uh, method. But luckily, C Sharp got us covered here. What we use for simplicity is not now some remote, remote source. Uh, we use actually the small snippet that's uh, on top of here. So we just supply the content via what is called in AngleShop a virtual response. So we say, oh, so you don't have an address where your page lives, you don't even have uh, anything like that. So you can just construct how the response to our request would look like. And we say, yeah, our response has the following content. It's this source. And it uh, also comes from a certain address. So the address is completely optional. I just included it here because we will see it in the document object model appearing as the base URI. And base URIs are very important because they give uh, relative URLs, well, the base that's required for resolving them. Um, all right, <clears throat> so when we do that, we end up with this uh, iDocument instance. And what we can now do is to illustrate that AngleShop did everything right, we serialize it back to an HTML string again using the toHTML method. So if I use this and run the code, you see the output. It's pretty much the same document that I inserted, except we suddenly get the HTML, we get the head, we also close the head, we open the body, and at the end of uh, our um, whole HTML document, we also close everything that was still open. But that's all done by AngleSharp. Now, the second example we had, we use the same code, um, just a different HTML snippet, we should see that the list items will be closed before we open a new one or before we close, obviously, the unsorted list. And the same applies here with the paragraph. We also need to close them properly. So let's just run it. And we see same action as on example one, except now, of course, in addition, we see um, all the scoping um, correctly evaluating. So far so good. Let's also have a look at the third one. And here, let's also debug what actually the document looks like. So before we write it to the console, let's just see what's in there. Uh, it could be a little bit too small. So I will just um, make it a little bit larger. I hope Skype plays with me here. Uh, so what we do is uh, we have all these um, capabilities that if you are familiar with the document object model API from JavaScript will, will look very familiar, right? Um, so for instance, we have an all property and that will contain all the elements in here. We can also iterate over them. Um, there could be a cookie, for instance, or uh, we see, of course, our base URI that was uh, successfully applied. So all these things are there and it's it's a full uh, document object model just um, done in C sharp without any remote procedure calls to, to uh, uh, Chrome or any other evergreen browser happening. Now regarding the output, that's uh, what we expected. Uh, so the the table row that was outside of the table that was completely omitted. Um, otherwise, um, we see the standard construction happening. The break row and the iframe have been pulled in front of the table and we see the insertion of the T-body happening. So all done for us by AngleSharp. It would have been done, of course, by Chrome or Firefox or any other evergreen browser out there too. So um, this is as the specification dictates. 
Okay, now let's talk about extensions for a moment. Um, so what you saw is what the core of AngleShop can, can do for you in, in a nutshell. So it really makes sure that whatever the HTML looks like on the page is interpreted 100% as a real browser would do, right? And um, that's of course important because you don't want to end up with something that's, well, not what you would expect from just, for instance, debugging it in, in Chrome. Now, the AngleShop core doesn't deal with JavaScript. AngleShop core also doesn't deal with, with CSS, um, but there are luckily there are these uh, plugins. And um, how the ecosystem looks like is we have this base layer of AngleShop core providing the common utilities, and then we place on top of it uh, useful libraries, like for instance, AngleShop CSS, which deals with the CSS object model. And we try also here to be fully W3C uh, conform, which means whenever they came up with a spec, how an API should look like, we follow that spec. So it's not only about behavior, it's also about what uh, the API looks like. Um, and that should give you some kind of a, of a learning improvement because if you know it already from JavaScript, you can apply it directly in, in uh, AngleSharp. If you know it from AngleSharp and someone asks you later to do it in JavaScript, well, you can also apply the knowledge there. And this two-in-one thing, in my opinion, is always um, is, is great to have. We also have AngleShop I.O., which we'll demo in a second. Um, this brings additional um, I.O. capabilities like requesters or cookie providers. And then we have libraries that are either in experimental stage, like AngleShop JS is one of these, or which are just planned, like AngleShop Media could be one of these things. That would then also support uh, certain kind of streaming capabilities. And uh, could also be quite cool if you say, oh, I got this site and there is a, is a video stream on it. I can log in and then suddenly I can bring this video stream to, I don't know, uh, WPF. That would be quite quite awesome. Um, but we're not there yet. But that's part of the vision. All right, so let's have a look at it. persistent cookies using AngleShop IO. Um, so a little bit of background to this demo. I got a web server running locally, a really simple one. There's a page which uh, needs a login mechanism to display a secret. Now, all the login mechanisms in the web pretty much work these days, either with, of course, some, some APIs, but then we are anywhere on the safe side if we have a JWT or anything like that, or we have a cookie-based uh, authentication. Um, that's for most of the sites that are relevant for AngleSharp, the case. So when we have this cookie problem, we potentially need a cookie solution, right? Um, out of the box, AngleSharp already brings a cookie provider, but that's based on the cookie container of .NET and that has several disadvantages. Most notably, it doesn't work with all the cookies out there on the web. It may crash, it may complain, oh, this state format I do, do not recognize. Um, so what we did in uh, one of the extension libraries called AngleShop IO, uh, we created a cookie um, provider following the official specification. And we even went further. Uh, what we have in there are two ways of using it. Uh, one way is in memory where you say, oh, okay, when the application closes, cookies are lost, it's good. And the other way is saying, oh, you can persist it or however you want to by default on the local file system. And uh, that's what it should show. So we use uh, a custom configuration now that's done like this. You have the configuration class and we just say, we start with the default one and then we add additional capabilities. So what we do is we add the persistent cookie capability and we say, oh yeah, you need to store it somewhere. The sync file path is in my documents, the file demo cookie. We also add additional requesters, like an HTTP requester that's based on the HTTP client. That's just more modern than the one that comes with AngleSharp out of the box. And um, then we say, yeah, AngleSharp, you're allowed to actually make requests to the network. So we say, with default loader. Now, when we run this thing, what will happen is, uh, we just switch to authentication. We will have different kinds of, of, of stages. Oh, sorry, I'm still need to remove 
this little file. So let's run it again. Sorry for that. Uh, we have different kinds of stages. So we start not being logged in. Um, so the page looks like this. You need to log in for obtaining the secret. Luckily, we have the login link here. So we navigate there. Then this page contains a form. We fill out the form with the user and the password, press login, it's all done. And then uh, we are automatically redirected. And here we see the secret. So obviously Bruce Wayne is Batman. What? But yeah, so that's just how the world works. And uh, this was the, the angle sharp or the, the code that we used in C sharp uh, using angle sharp. Uh, we say, okay, we can use a query selector. If it's there, uh, we navigate to it. Then we submit the form and then we are locked in. Now, if I run it again, this cookie file is created, uh, has been created, and so we are already logged in. So we see the secret directly. I'm Batman. Great. And the reason how it works is because, sorry, is because, um, yeah, we have this file that follows the old Netscape cookie file specification, and that actually includes all these different cookies that have been used now for the localhost um, domain. And we just transport that over. All right, so going into the final stages, uh, I also want to show you JavaScript before wrapping up. Now, JavaScript, as I said, is also just a, a library um, in an experimental stage. We only need to use WizJS, and then we can apply some simple JavaScript. Let's just make the demo before we run out of time. Um, pretty much the same thing. Now, what we will change is the document title because that's right now sample and it will be changed to simple manipulation. What we will also do is we will write out this special kind of spawn element. So let's just run it. And what we can see is the title changed now in the serialization. It's now simple manipulation, and we got this spawn. Great. So this simple JavaScript was applied correctly, evaluated correctly. Again, uh, AngleSharp JS is experimental, and um, you will not be able to, to run, let's say, large-scale single-page applications with it at the moment. OK. So. Next steps. Um, obviously, shipping 1.0 is very important. Improving English up JS, super important. And then refining uh, things of the ecosystem like English up uh, CSS or bringing up new um, additional libraries like Wasm is, for instance, a, a thing, especially with, with Blazor around the block. That could be really interesting. English up Media is said, but also things like English up Renderer could be uh, quite interesting, especially if you want to say everything is just managed code. I don't need a web browser for displaying uh, HTML. Um, which could open a lot of interesting uh, use cases, in my opinion. We are always looking for contributors. Uh, would be much appreciated if you have a look. Um, any kind of contribution may be finding a bug, uh, fixing something on the documentation, or also discussing how the API could be improved um, would be superb. Um, I appreciate all your time. Um, you find more information about the project at angleshop.github.io, and you can always uh, give me a tweet or uh, reach us via, via, for instance, our Gitter chat. Thanks a lot. All right, Florian. That was Thank great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was great. I've, I tried parsing HTML with some regular expressions back in the it's day. It's madness. It's just madness. It's, <laughs> it is madness. It works for the simple ones, though, but <laughs> once you don't know what you are receiving, you are just out of luck, I guess. <laughs> HTML has got so many quirks, as you showed, and, and uh, we're thankful that you're doing the hard work so we don't have to. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, thanks so good. much, Florian. You have a good day and uh, enjoy gonna... Oktoberfest. Enjoy Oktoberfest. Thanks. <laughs> and, uh, we're gonna I get will. Ready for Come our next over, speaker. guys. Uh, yeah. There's plenty of space here. <laughs> All righty. Take care. Take care. Bye.